I just want to jump into it. Um, so what was life before the disturbance? I think when people think about refugees, they think about what the media portrays, but you know, we all have lives before disturbance, you know, kind of starts. And so give us an insight into your world, you know, before everything kind of shook up. Excellent. Uh, I was born in a small country called Burundi, and Burundi is a situated in the east central of Africa. It's around Congo, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And uh, it's a beautiful country. Um, and uh, I was born in a family of seven uh, siblings. I'm the firstborn. And my family, lives, they live on the farm. Um, we have, you know, uh, cows. We have, you know, a plantation of coffee. And my family, I would say, is, you know, rich, you know, in that neighborhood. So life was good. Uh, my parents, you know, they sent me to school um, because they wanted me to be well educated. They didn't want me to have the lifestyle of a farmer. Okay. And um, my dad did, you know, did everything to make sure that I get a good education. And um, when I was in high school, actually, I fell in love with, you know, English, uh, even though f French is our, you know, official language. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, trying to memorize, you know, 10 words, you know, um, a day, um, trying to make sure that uh, I know so many words and speak, you know, English better. And that helped me to land a job in the United Nations, uh, became a translator in 2005. Um, and during that time, life, life was great. I was well paid. Um, it was amazing. Um, yeah. So you, you had a normal life. Like, yeah. it's just like you're a normal person. You have a family. Um, and things are going well, like anyone would assume in a normal you know, capacity. Uh, what, what, what happened you know, that caused the disruption? What changed that led you to this new life that you have? Uh, as you know, uh, Burundi is known by a civil war that has been going on for years and years. Um, in my country, we have two ethnic groups, Hutu and Tutsi. Mm -hmm. And those two ethnic groups have been fighting for power for many years. Um, uh, you know, at one time, you know, this ethnic group is ruling the country and they don't want to share the power with other people. Okay. And that created a conflict that has uh, taken lives of people. And in 2005, um, there was a group of rebels who were fighting you know, against the government during that time because they wanted to take over and rule the country. They were not happy with the other group you know, uh, leading the country. And then uh, the conflict was really worse up to the point uh, the United Nations deployed a peacekeeping mission to come and help a power, you know, find peace. And um, that's how they wanted to have translators because, like I said, uh, my country uses French and those peace peak, uh, peacekeepers, they, they, couldn't speak they, French. Yeah, they spoke English. Okay. And um, that's how I landed, you know, a job in the United Nations as a translator to help them, you know, communicate with, you know, the local community. Um, and make sure that they have the information of what is going on and know how to protect everybody, you know. And themselves. And, yes. And this passion of a normal guy, yeah. love for education, learning English, is now the reason for you having an employment with the United Nations, yeah. which life is good at this point in time, but yep. you're still trying to help your people and help Absolutely. the UN enable peace in your country. Yeah. Um, and then... What happened was um, I worked in the UN for nine months. Okay. Um, actually, I was employed you know, locally. That means I had to work for nine months. And then after nine months, I had to go and leave for three months and then come back and sign another contract. Oh, okay. It's not like when you are employed from New York, you know, uh, that way you have, you know. Yeah, so yeah. like contracting terms, yeah. you mm -hmm. couldn't work 12 mm -hmm. months at a time. You no. have to take some time off. Yeah. And during the United Nations, I was staying in the base. 
So I was protected, you know, anytime we went in the community, we had um, an escort, you know, going with us and uh, nobody could touch us, you know. And then when I went on leave, um, I'm a runner. I remember one day, it was in the evening, I was coming from um, a running walk up. Um, as I reached, you know, the gate of our family's house, I saw just a group of people who were just staying in front of, you know, our house. And I thought that they were just, you know, guys who were uh, from the neighborhood who were just hanging out. Um, as, you know, I reached them, I heard just like two or three guys jumping on me and saying that I was their enemy. And I was confused and I was like, I don't know even, I don't, I don't even know you. So how come? I am your enemy. And they said, your job in the UN uh, is not good for us. Uh, you are helping the UN to destroy us. Uh, when they told me that, uh, I understood that there were some of those, you know, the bad rebels. guys, you know, yeah. rebels who were fighting against the government. During that time, I was kidnapped from that place and I was taken to the jungle where they were staying. And, um, you know, in that place I went through horrible, you know, things, you know, torture. Um, I remember they just, you know, um, put me in a small room that was kind of, you know, abandoned house that was, you know, far away from the city. Um, that's where they were staying. And then I was put in a small room without windows, nothing, um, no restroom in that place. And um, what they did, they just, you know, put a small basket, you know, um, in the room. And they told me, anytime you want to ease yourself, you can use that. So the place was, you know, stinking so bad. Um, I will never forget that. And it was always dark. Um, and in the morning, they could take me outside and then just beat me beat up you. and um, uh, trying to get more information about what the UN was planning to do against them. Um, I remember one day they tried to cut, you know, this part on my body. And so I, I still have a scar here, um, but, you know. So that you can't, you can't run away. Yeah, they didn't want me to run away. Um, and um, the way uh, I was able to escape, uh, I remember one morning, um, what I heard was like, a, you know, this big noise over the place, like a big, you know, a, a thunder and, um, and I heard, you know, gunshots and uh, everybody was running away. There was a huge smoke all over the place. And I tried to drag myself while everybody was running away. And um, I was able to be found by the UN peacekeepers just laying on the street just nearby. Um, and um, they, managing not to know who I was. Direct from your work? Yes. So, and okay. then um, they asked me what happened. I told them and they said, can we uh, take you back home? And they said no, because going back home was dangerous for me and also for my family. And um, I told them that I had an uncle who was living in the north of the country. Uh, that's where they took me. But after a few days, we heard that there were some unknown people who were coming around my uncle's house. And we thought, oh, those are some of those bad guys who are tracking me down because they don't want me to release the information I saw in that place where I was, you know, um, imprisoned. Um, so, uh, and then um, after, you know, a few days, my family sat down and they said, hey, uh, this, the country is very small, so there's no place, you know, to hide. To hide, they'll find you. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that's how they came up with the decision for me to leave the country. And I think, I think that's interesting because when, when you think about displacement, being a refugee, uh, not many people think about choices, right? It's never that person's choice to leave their country. Um, Absolutely. I remember myself uh, back in 1993, similar to your, your life. I mean, my dad worked in the government. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, six kids, like normal life. I mean, I recall specifically um, we had a solar panel. And so f for me, that was like an indication of like, normal life in 1993, you know, with a solar panel. And so extrapolate to today, 
if things were peaceful, right, yeah. life could have been even better than uh, what I imagined then. And so, uh, but for me, it was more so in 1993 at night, my father came home and it was just like, we have to go. I'm three years old, um, don't really know what's going on. And <laughs> we got literally, literally drugged through like a rainforest. Uh, mm -hmm. Liberia has a lot of vegetation and like the rainforest is very rich and so, it's like evergreen, and so year round, like the yeah. forest is full. And yeah, just through a series of events, uh, we found ourselves in line waiting to cross the St. Paul River mm -hmm. into Ivory Coast. And we also had like UN peacekeepers, yeah. you know, protecting that line of people trying to escape. Um, and it's crazy because I was so young, but I remember yeah. these things vividly. Um, and so we managed to escape into Ivory Coast by a raft. Um, and Ivory Coast is, is a French speaking country and Liberia is an English speaking country. And mm -hmm. so uh, the decision was made to kind of create space for yeah. the Liberians who want to go to an English speaking country and wow. gone and created a space for us. Um, so in 1993, my family and many others were uh, one of the first settlers wow. uh, in Ghana. And so um, at this point, we became a refugee. Like, you know, last thing I remember about school was I loved school, like went to like a night nice school in yeah. my, in my, you know, in my neighborhood. But, you know, one of the things I recall asking my, my mom and dad, was just like, when am I going to go to school? Cause I loved school, you yeah. know, I met friends, I was talkative and all that stuff. And so tell me, you know, at this point, you've made the decision, you yeah. know, to leave the country because yeah. of safety, yeah. you know, similar to what my family had to do. Yeah. Um, you became a refugee as well. Yeah. What was life as a refugee like for you in this initial stages? Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, um, making a decision to leave your family, your country, the culture, everything that you are familiar with and decide to go in an unknown place and become a refugee, it is a tough decision to make. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what to, expe to expect. But uh, during that time, uh, that was the only option left for me because my life was in danger. And um, I remember saying goodbye to my family and my siblings. I, I cried a lot because there was no hope that I was going to see them again because I didn't know what was, you know, I had. Life in the unknown, yeah. right? Yeah. Especially coming from, from torture. Yes. And thinking about the potential for harm. Yeah. And um, guess what? During that time, I didn't have a passport to cross, you know, those countries because I went to Ethiopia to be a refugee, but I didn't have a passport. So what my family did was, okay, uh, we do have uh, a friend who is a businessman who goes, you know, to Kenya. We ask him to give you a ride and go to Kenya, and that way he can go from Kenya to Ethiopia and ask asylum. Mm. So what this friend of um, my family did was he said, okay, I will do you this favor. What I have to do is I will tell, you know, the uh, immigration officers on on, uh, on the borders when you are crossing countries that you were my driver assistant. That's how I was able to, to, you know, to cross, you know, those borders. For me to get to Ethiopia where I had to go and ask asylum. Uh, that was tough. Uh, and then once I got to Ethiopia, I report myself to the immigration office, told them the whole story. And um, they listened to me. Uh, I told them that I was working in the UN, all those kind of stuff. And then uh, immediately they gave me a refugee ID. Mm. And then they sent me to the refugee camp. Did they assign you to yes. like an area? Yes. Because I recall at some point now, like the camp where we stay, we started in like tents mm -hmm. and then like gradually started becoming like yeah, it you was know, from tents to like bigger tents yeah. to like mud houses and things yeah. like that. What was it like? Yeah, it is the same thing. You know, once you arrive, there is no like 
the little house for you. They give you a tent. Or a blanket. Yeah, <laughs> and a blanket. And they, they don't even give you a mattress. <laughs> they just, you know, sleep on the floor, you know. Um, and then they give you a tent. It's like you are camping, you know, for for a while. And then... It's crazy because I haven't been camping as an adult or a free man because I don't know if it has relation to that, but yeah. the idea of being in the tent, it just doesn't yeah. sit well with me. And then uh, you had to live in that tent for like two or three months while, until you get some friends who will come and help you build some kind of a house with mud. Like a structure, yes. something. Yeah. yeah, something. And then from there, you can just, you know, stay in that. And the crazy thing is um, we didn't have, you know, enough food to eat. We are starving all the time. Um, I still remember uh, every day in the evening, kids crying before they go to bed because their parents didn't get, you know, dinner to give them. And... There are some families, the crazy thing, they would pretend as if they are, you know, cooking something, and, but they are just boiling water, and then they cover it. And kids, you know, at night, they, they are hoping that their parents are, you know, cooking food. That until hope, they fall asleep. That hope and takes goes, you, <laughs> you start working your brain, and then yeah. you get tired. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they sleep. So it was just like that. And um, in the refugee camp, we didn't have jobs. So it was a boring life. Uh, and that's a young man, a young man. I had no future for, you know, vision for my, you know, the future of my life because no job, nothing, no school. So it was like being in an open prison. Yeah, you, know? you just, you just live in like a hopeless life. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I remember the UN, um, UNHCR, that's the mm -hmm. United Nations High Commission for Refugees, like they would deploy people in these camps to make sure humanitarian you know, efforts are being met. Uh, but it's very basic. It's like, the, it's like the most minimum standard that they're looking for because I think ultimately survival is the name of the game, not yeah. necessarily like yeah. good life. Um, and they will bring rations. So like you're standing in line, you yeah. go by like the area you're assigned. Yeah. So in Budaburam, that's the name of the camp in Ghana, uh, we had areas from area A, B, C, D to U, to like Z, and we lived in area U. <laughs> and so you can imagine the allotment of food that came started with, you know, um, area A and the people that live in area A. And so yeah. by the time you get to like, yeah. like U, there's a good chance there's no food. There's yeah. a good chance. And so uh, you had to be kind of creative <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. just to survive. Yeah. Uh, but... Yeah. Um, I don't know, like just hearing your life as an adult in a refugee camp versus mine as a kid. Yeah. It's like very unique because at some point I thought that was normalcy. I thought that was life. I thought this is what life is because my experience of the yeah. world yeah. was being formed in yeah. such a captive place. Yeah. Um, but you still had ideas of what could have what could have been yeah. as an adult man. Yeah. And so how did you manage navigating being an adult in a refugee camp with no hope and no resources, um, knowing that you've had a life prior to that that was more meaningful? Um, it was challenging. Uh, it was really challenging because, like you said, I was an adult and um, I was living, you know, my family where I had a good job working in the UN was a luxury. And um, now finding myself in that kind of situation it was really, really tough. I remember many times I could sit down and, and I'm like, what did I do to deserve this? Mm. What did I do to deserve this? And I could try to imagine the way out for me to get out from that situation. And I could not see how that will happen. It's like when you, when, you, when you think about possibilities and possibilities don't exist. Yes. I don't know if people have experienced that, but, you know, and we'll come back to this, but I tell people, like, the idea that, I'm, you know, that I work at Google today, yeah. you know, some people, some of you in the audience probably have a slight intuition that if I work hard, this could happen. But, like, this yeah. is just something that, like, 
just never appear in my imagination. Yeah. And so I can imagine thinking about possibilities, yeah. but you don't have a stimulus to like guide you towards what that could be. Yeah. And um, what I have um, experienced, you know, in the refugee camp, there are people who lose hope and they are like, okay, I don't care. So they try to abuse, you know, drugs. Drugs or... or they violence. Just, yeah, violence, or they sleep with women. You know, they don't care about, you know, diseases or whatever, because they are like, I'm done. I can do whatever I want and die. So that, that is what is, you know, happening most of the time. And um, for me, like I said, I was a runner before. And Ethiopia is a country that has, you know, the fastest runners in the world. And um, I would always wake up in the morning, go for a run, and run with some of the famous, you know, athletes, you know, from Ethiopia. And always I was like, maybe one day I would become better. And, yeah, then, right <laughs> and then go uh, run in an international race and, you know, get, you know, some prize money and then maybe I'll get out from this. So I would always go and just, you know, train with them and it became like a therapy, you know, for me. Um, so that is, you know, something that kept me going. Um, and because I knew as a runner, if I messed up, you know, doing, you know, crazy stuff, um, yeah, no good performance, and, you know, yeah, you have to be disciplined, you know, to, to be a good runner and mm -hmm. run well. And I think that kept me on the right track um, not, uh, and prevent me to not go around and do and make bad stuff. decisions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? Like there's the refugee camp. You've talked about this experience, hopelessness, um, lack of opportunity, not even that, but like just the lack of the potential to even think about opportunities. Yeah. Um, at what point did things turn around? You're in the US, of course, that was a process. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so it was in 2011. I had a friend from Congo. He was a good friend of mine. We would always hang out together and just, um, yeah. Uh, and then one day he came to uh, the place where I was staying because a refugee camp is like a big city, okay? And it's so someone place. would, yeah. Um, I remember the refugee camp I was living in uh, had almost um, 12,000 people, you know, living in that place. And then you would find, you know, someone living over here and then another, your friend is living on the other side of the camp. So, yeah, miles and miles. And then he came to visit me and he said, hey, uh, I saw your name on the list of the people who are going to be resettled to the, U to the U.S. Um, because as you know, U.S. is always taking refugees from refugee, refugee camps and then they bring That them used to over be here. the norm. Yes. <laughs> and that used then, to be the norm. Yeah, and then he came to me and he said, hey, come, uh, I saw your name on the list of the people that U.S. is going to take. To tell you the truth, I, I looked at him in his eyes and I'm like, wait a minute, are you kidding? Not me, it can't, it can't be me, <laughs> not at all. And then he was like, yeah, I saw your name. And he was like, your name is so-and-so, right? And I said, yeah. Uh, and they said, yeah, I saw your name. And he was like, oh man, you're lucky. And I'm like, I don't know if this is true. And it was in the, in, the, in the evening and early in the morning, I remember as a runner, I ran so fast <laughs> to the office of UNHCR to check, you know, if really my name was on the list. And uh, the distance between where I was living and the office was like two miles. Mm -hmm. And I think I broke the world record on that distance, <laughs> you know, running so fast to go and find out. And I remember looking at the list and um, I saw my name, but 
I read my name maybe 10 times to make sure that the spelling was great. <laughs> you know, it's not someone. This has to be me. <laughs> yeah, this has to be me, <laughs> not someone else. And I remember from that moment, um, my heart was, you know, uh, full of joy. I, I was so happy. And I was like, oh, no. Am I going to go to the U.S., the great country on planet Earth? That was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I was scheduled for interviews because what people don't know when you are choosing to come here, you don't travel the next day. Yeah. There is a vetting you know, process that we have to go through. Um, and the people who interview you, they fly from here. They're you know, FBI and CIA agents. You know, they go and interview you know, the refugees to make sure that um, dangerous people uh, don't, and, come yeah, the don't come here. And you go through the medical checkups. So um, for me, my process took, you know, 12 months, a whole yeah. year. I recall, I mean, I had, so I came to the U.S. in 2006 from the refugee camp in Ghana. And I came with my mom, brothers and sisters. And it was like, I think, six or seven of us total. But it took us about a year and a half to go through mm -hmm. the full interview process. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really great point because yeah. we live in the times where when people hear refugees yeah. or, or immigrants, yeah. like they automatically assume that if you're here uh, barring you know, certain circumstances yeah. that you're like a, you know, like a negative person. But yeah. we had to know our family history. <laughs> um, I was 15 when I came here. And so I, I believe the interviews probably started about when I was 13. You had to memorize the family history, yeah. like the reason why, where yep. you lived in yep. your country, yep. um, the sequence of events yes. that led the you dates. to become a refugee. Yep. The dates have to align. Yep. Your little sister would go in. Yep. She'd get interviewed. Your mother would get it. Like, it was so thorough. Yep. Um, and so you got through the process. I remember, <laughs> you know, during the interview, the first one took two hours. And uh, there was a time... He asked me a question, and then he asked me that question again, like after an hour and a half, mm -hmm. to make sure that I would give the same answer. And during that time, I was tired, and I was like, I don't want to go through all this, you know, <laughs> to go to the US. And I was like, You remember the answer I gave you before? And then he smiled, and, you know, he was like, Yeah, he smiled. I think he was like, Oh, okay. He knows that I asked that question before. <laughs> and um, I went out from that room. I, you know, my, I could not hear because I was so nervous and it was so intense up to the point. It was like in my ear there was water. Wow. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you, you go underwater and then yeah, water so goes into your ear. Like yes, something that's is, yeah. how I felt because it was so intense and I was so nervous. I'm always like, I don't want to blow up, you know, <laughs> this you know, opportunity. And um, um, after that, I went through other interviews, almost like seven of them. Yeah. So It's like a Google interview. Yeah. <laughs> so I always tell people uh, who say, oh, refugees are dangerous. I'm like, no, you don't know uh, the kind of interviews you have to go through before you come here. It is so intense um, up to the point you feel like, okay, if I have to go through this, I don't wanna go. But I think, you know, part of that intensity, which I think every country should do, right? If yeah. you are having people come in the country, you wanna vet and make sure that, you know, yeah. they're who they say they are. Um, but part of that intensity, you know, prepares you for we know what's next sure. right and so sure. uh, I want to move on to like what's next because for me yeah uh, I came in the US to Oklahoma yeah and it, I came here February 2nd today is the what today is the 12th it's December 12th so I can tell you I've been in the States 13 years 11 months and 10 days like I just know that date yeah it's something that is so important to me because yeah. um, I remember the day I came and who I came as, mm. and I always look to that day to compare, like, have I grown enough or have I made myself yeah. proud or my family or am I working hard enough? And so 
life in the U.S. takes its own, you know, kind of like turn, yep. right? So you come yep. from this tumultuous life as a refugee, yep. feeling like you don't belong, feeling yep. isolated, yep. no hope, no opportunities yep. to this great country, but then you're met with some obstacles. And so tell yep. us about, you know, arriving in the U.S. and what has kind of transpired since then. First of all, I remember uh, leaving, you know, the international airport of Ethiopia. Um, I remember stepping on the plane for the first time in my life, um, coming from the refugee camp. I felt, first of all, like I had a big burden I was carrying on my shoulders, and I felt like it fell off. I felt relieved. But at the same time, I remembered the thousands of refugees I was living in the refugee camp who didn't get the opportunity I got. Mm -hmm. And I cried. The friends I left, you know, there, suffering. And now I was going to a better place. So it was a mixed, you know, feeling during that time. I remember, you know, flying to US. Um, at some point I was crying, um, tears of joy, but at the same time, um, sorrow. sorrow, because I could remember how much, you know, the people I left in the refugee camp was, were suffering. And then, actually, I f in my port of entry was LA, International Airport. I landed, and I was like, I've never seen such a huge airport in my life. It was crazy. It was, wow. And I was so happy, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then, the same day, I flew to Spokane. Washington. I didn't know about Spokane before. I, was, and I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and then the amazing thing was when I showed up at the International Airport of Spokane, there was um, a case worker from an international organization called World Relief mm -hmm. who was coming to receive me because when you come, they know everything about you, who is coming, and they are ready. And then he was at the airport. And then when I showed up, I heard somebody uh, shouting my name. And I was like, whoa, how did he know my name? And the pronunciation was great. I don't know if he was you know, uh, practicing all that time, you know, how to pronounce Good my chance. name. Yeah. And then um, uh, he drove me to the apartment uh, where I was staying. Um, and then um, after you know, two days, they started doing um, job search for me. And after a month, I was hired at Walmart as an overnight stalker. Yeah. And Walmart was like a notion, you know, for me because we don't have Walmarts back home. And I was like, whoa. And then I was working in the grocery, you know, um, oh, department. Yeah. And I could not imagine how much you know food you guys have and I was like whoa <laughs> and it took me a while just to memorize the names of everything to know where to put them on the shelves and I was but at the same time I was like that's great I will never starve again in my life yeah so something so small right yeah um yeah I mean I remember when we came to the United States uh we got placed um in like a mixed shift house yeah, yeah. um and i think you know about a month later w it was one of those like you have to find a job yeah. and so i had always been working you know because my mom you know she had like a little small business i remember even on the refugee camp i would sell yeah. kerosene mm -hmm. uh at night uh so that people can like lit their lanterns um to like study or I would sell block of ice. So yeah. like my mom had a freezer, like, like a deep freezer. Mm -hmm. And so we would like put water in the plastic bag and like yeah. squeeze it to make the bag fatter yeah. to have more room for water and then tie it up and then freeze it. Yeah. And then you gotta, you gotta go sell the ice in the like 110 degrees weather. Yeah. But like make sure that you're selling it in time so that everything doesn't melt and uh -huh. you just lose the money. Yeah. And so, um, the notion of working was like not new to me. And so mm -hmm. when we came to the US, quickly uh, we were all able to find a job. Yeah. Uh, first job, which I can never forget, was KFC. Uh, wow. <laughs> it's funny because, you know, um, 
KFC meant so much to me and my family because we were still starving in Oklahoma. And yeah. so I would take 18 piece buckets home at night because I would just work 18 hours on the weekend. Wow. And I would come home with like a bunch of chicken. Like, and my mom loved it. Yeah. My little sister loved it. And it just became like the thing that you do, right? And so the goal was to work in places that can feed me mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have enough money mm -hmm. um, to like just get get things going. Let's talk about now, like, okay. you know, um, quickly, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, like, what are you doing now? Like, you know, what has life for Calm become? You know, life is wonderful. Uh, I became a US citizen last year in, uh, uh, in June. Congrats. Thank I you. I became a citizen in June last Yay! year. Yay! <laughs> That's awesome, man. Um, That's cool. So um, life has been good. Uh, I would say that this country is best, you know, country on planet Earth to live in. Mm -hmm. um, there's no other better place, you know, than this one. Um, there are so many opportunities. Of course, if you work hard. Yes. Um, I graduated from college this last May. Congrats. And um, yeah, yeah. And I now teach French in a high school, a private high school. Um, but I teach part time. Okay. Uh, but it's been great. It's, you know, this is my fourth year teaching, uh, and I just got an opportunity in um, the same organization that brought you into the U.S. Yes, uh, and I'm going to be working there as um, a case, you know, manager. Um, so, it's so be like great. the circle of life, right? Yes. You get to welcome other people yeah. coming from a very stressful life. Um, Congratulations. Thank I th you. I think that's amazing. We yeah. should all clap for Calm. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think when you, when you think of displacement, it really does a lot to, to you as a person. Um, I mean, like, you have to find yourself in new spaces. You have to find identity. You have to find belief. You have to find courage. And what, to your point, what was so hard for me as a kid, uh, I made a lot of friends growing up on the camp and we were all kids and so we thought that was our normal life. But then I realized when I stepped on the plane myself, it was like yeah. I, I would never see them again. Um, yeah. And I don't know, that, that you know, detachment has made it difficult you know, for me um, because I'm always feeling like I'm alone in new spaces. Yeah. Like the more you work hard, the yeah. more you become the only one from your family. Yeah. Going to new spaces and then having to build community. Yeah. And there's all these, you know, layers of trauma like yeah. that you have to battle with yourself, battle with the environment that you're in. Um, but like you, you know, life has been fortunate, you know, for me as well. Uh, I graduated from KFC. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, actually left KFC to JC because I needed clothes. <laughs> um, and uh, JC and then migrated, went to college. College in itself was a different story that we yeah. can talk about later. But yeah, I now work at Google. Uh, my manager is sitting here uh, in the Search and Discovery Org uh, as a program manager. And so um, it's been a long journey, and I think we all can learn a lot from sure. your story. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can learn a lot from each other. Uh, because a lot of people in the U.S. don't know what it's to come as a refugee, uh, where you find it hard to present yourselves as refugees? Was that something that beco that become a discriminatory factor for you, or in general, people was really welcoming and and make you feel part of the community? Um. So for me, I came to the states when I was 15, and. For some reason, and I think we can all know the reasons here, I got placed in an all-black school. And so this all-black school was on the poorest side of town, the worst education in Oklahoma. And so um, as a 15-year-old kid, refugee or not, you struggle with identity, right? And so I came from this life that is, you know, I still recount things vividly, um, but I've been kind of working through them individually on my own. So. For me, it was difficult to identify as a refugee um, because a 15-year-old boy getting teased 
about living with lions, tigers, and bears, or like not having anything growing up. I didn't have anything growing up. And so for me to like admit to that while everyone else around me like just had a normal life, it was tough. Um, I even remember, this is a funny anecdote, but I remember, you know, when you're in high school, like you talk to girls or whatever in, in the mall. And like, I went up to this girl and like said hi to her. And she asked me, oh, your accent. I was like, yeah, you know. She's like, where are you from? I said, Jamaica. <laughs> and I reflect on that now to the extent of trauma and like the extent of things that you go through and identity and like, you know, finding yourself because I was afraid to say that I was African, much less a refugee. Because the kids in my school bullied me to the extent that I didn't want to identify with my own self. So for me, it was difficult identifying as a refugee. All throughout college, I was a kid that was involved, and so I hung with the African students that came from Africa from a good life, and so I got placed in that bubble. Um, and these kind of conversations never happened publicly, much less privately. And so it wasn't until like 2016 that I decided I know, you know, I think my life is having more meaning for myself, and I get to own my identity and reshape my story and tell it. So I don't know about you. Yeah. Um, for me, I would say that I didn't have, uh, you know, so much problems when I came because when I came, um, the office that helped me to come here, they provided a volunteer family that, you know, volunteered to show me around mm -hmm. and to teach me, you know, about the American life. So they would come, for instance, our home and uh, uh, show me how to use, you know, stuff in the house because it's totally different from where I'm from. They will take me to the store um, to show me how to, you know, to buy stuff. Uh, and um, I'm a runner, so these volunteers, they, you know, they connected me to the running community. Uh, and those people became my friends. Uh, and it was nice because uh, I ran fast than them, and <laughs> that was a kind of, you know, asset for me to brag on, and then they would be like, oh, wow, you're so fast, you know, something <laughs> like that, and it, I would feel good, and then everybody would like, you know, to hang out with me, because if there was a race, I, I, I knew I was going to win, and that was, <laughs> was a little, you know, star, you know, something like that. So that helped me a lot to, um, to engage in the community and to be known. Um, I remember the first month, actually, the local TV, you know, came to have an interview with me, and that was oh, on wow. TV, and that was like, oh, okay, now I, I feel good. So I didn't have um, any challenge of feeling like I'm rejected, but everybody was like, we want to hang out with you because we're famous, you know, something like that. So it was totally different for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, after that, I got a lot of community from uh, the church I attend, and it was really great. It was amazing. Yeah. 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 What was, like, the number one resources that you guys looked for as soon as you got here? What was, like, the number one thing that kept you guys going and you can rely on, like, solely and heavily? For me, my older sister was already here, and so uh, she moved to the U.S. in 2011. And in part, she's the only reason why we are here. Like, she told and, like, did everything that she could to get her family here. Um, and so it was good to have her. Um, but for me, I was looking for school. <laughs> like I wanted to get back in school. I was, I had graduated high school at 15, you know, before coming to the U.S. But when you go to high school on a refugee camp, you can see how that is credited in the U.S. So they just placed me back in school, which was really great for me. Because um, though it was challenging, um, I started to find ways to assimilate, and that's in part why I sound the way I sound. My family doesn't sound like me at all. Uh, I started playing sports, running. Uh, my coach thought I was from Kenya, <laughs> and so he called me Motherland, and he said I should join a track team. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I did, and I became the famous African that was running track in Oklahoma. Um, uh, we won state championship that year, so it was cool. Uh, but no, uh, so school was it for me, just, you know, trying. 
I had a realization that I can do more with school. And so um, that was just where I wanted to be. And so that kind of took my mind off of some of the things that were traumatic uh, coming in. Yeah, I will say that is the same thing also for me. Um, when I came, um, I didn't have you know any other member of my family here. So up to now, I'm the only one here in the US. Um, but the people I told you that who came to me and volunteered to show me around and teach me life, um, they are successful people and I will go to their house and see the lifestyle they have. And I was like, I want to be like this. And um, uh, that's when I tried to find um, good school uh, in my city um, because I value so much education mm. because I know that uh, education can open, you know, doors for you um, that cannot be opened if you don't have that paper, you know. <laughs> and uh, um, that's how I decided to go back to school. And I was going to school at the same time working because I had to find, you know, money to pay for rent and everything. And um, it was tough, but I did it. Um, and so... The big resource I really needed during that time was school. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I graduated, I have to work hard and serve, um, you know, the community where I will be and also give back to this nation that has given me much. Yeah. So it's amazing to hear and coming from a very secure family and kind of middle class living, it's unimaginable to see you today, what you have gone through and to turn out to be such wonderful citizens. What I want to ask you is now that you are where you are, how are you lending your voice, especially in today's environment when there's so much false information around refugees and the, they're being cast in a whole different lens and color and you are two great examples. So how you sort of trying to change that conversation or be more vocal about, hey, I'm a refugee. This is what, where I came from, but this is what I am, and I'm such a valuable contributor to this society. And then uh, for you especially, Kwam, have you ever gone, been able to go back now and meet your family and friends back in your home country? Yes. Um I'm going to start with your last question. Yes, uh, it was back home this last August. I went back and I spent, you know, um, my time with my family for 40 days. And that was a long time, you know, it was enough. And um, it was amazing to see my family again. And uh, what was um, strange, I left, you know, the little brother I left when he was three years old, now he's 15 years old and he's big boy and it was crazy to see him because the memory I had for of him was when he was a little you know boy um, so yeah I went back um, then came back engaged and um, now I'm you know planning to get married sometime soon and uh, uh, to answer, you know, your first question is, um, um, as you all know, there is, you know, a wrong narrative about refugees um, uh, going on right now. Um, but uh, the time I came, I decided to stand up and share my story, not for people to pity me and say, hey, Yo, yeah, you suffered or something. No, uh, I decided to do that to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Thousands of people are in the refugee camp right now as we speak. Um, and the reason why I do that is because um, uh, when I came here, I realized that the richest places in the world are in the refugee camps, why? Because we all are born, but you know, with potential, you know, nobody's an accident here on earth. And so I always think like some of the solutions we are looking for are trapped in the lives of refugees who are in the refugee camps. 
And those refugees, they don't have the opportunity to be in a place like U.S. where they can release that potential and serve other people because we are all interconnected. Some people, they say, oh, you know, the civil war that is going on in that country, uh, it's not our problem as long as we are safe here, we have everything. I don't think so. We, we all belong in the human race. And when that, when that group of people is suffering, we are all suffering. That affects our life. That's why I decided to stand up and speak up for those refugees who are um, seen or thought as dangerous and tell people that the dangerous person is not a, the refugee. The, the dangerous person is the one who made them a refugee. Look at me, look at us. We are here, we're not dangerous at all, all right? Um, so that's why I decided to stand up and try to give the right image of who a refugee is. Yeah, that's, and that's what I do today, yeah. And to speak to your first question, um, it's been a tough thing to do, right? Um, like even in the US, at some point I still felt like my life had no meaning. And so who am I to like voice, you know, like anything, like coming in at 15 and just navigating through like the, you know, like the poverty and structure um, and realizing, you know, that I'm black in America as well, right? So like there are like a ton of things coming to you at different angles that you have to navigate and I came as a boy. Um, and so um, it hasn't been an easy thing to like stand up and speak uh, like you did. Uh, I think coming as an adult has been, like you have some sense of identity already. Mm -hmm. And so it's something that I'm doing more of. Uh, it's very uncomfortable. Uh, but I recall my very first event that I did at Google, we raised $35,000 for the International Refugee Foundation in Oakland. And sometimes you have to balance, especially in my, in my position, you have to balance like still kind of like survival, right? It's like, how can I get myself to a place that like, I feel secure in my job? I feel you know, secure financially. I feel secure mentally. Uh, and go out and speak for others and be vulnerable for others. And so um, it's something that I've made a commitment to do more of uh, in the 2020. Um, and yeah, um, I think my life now lands a little bit more insight into the resilience of a refugee, into the power of access and the power of opportunity and nurturing. And so any kid, you know, like me or, you know, any kid, you know, out there with the same opportunities, uh, you know, could, could be like me. And I think one of the reasons, you know, talking to Kat that I wanted to have this conversation was to kind of draw the proximity to Googlers, right? Because I think oftentimes we're in this bubble and we all come from the IVs and, and we all come from these amazing lives. And our problems are like, you know, do we have, you know, like, food in the market kitchen, you know, or, you know, yeah. or, or, you know, oh my God, like TGIF is gone, right? And so, <laughs> uh, but like trying to draw the proximity because if I'm at Google, you know, as a refugee of 13 years, um, to your point about the resources, yeah. what can become of those people who are trapped in these places uh, without any access to education? Because all I wanted as a boy, <laughs> was a protractor, like I wanted a, a math set. I was really good at math, like, you know, but like you die with those potential. And at some point, at some point, realistically, uh, I embraced nothingness because I graduated high school. Where else do you go? I mean, do you go farm or do you go work with a, like a, like a, like a handsmith to like sew like slippers or like sell, you know, I was already good at selling kerosene and ice. So I could do that, right? And so, um, 
But I'm making a commitment to myself to do that more. Because um, I have nieces and nephews that look at me uh, now, and uh, they think the life that I live today has been the life that I've always had. And that's what many people also think. And so I think it's an unfair representation of the other people left behind if I don't speak up. Um, I want to just, you know, uh, thank everyone, you know, who came to listen to us and uh, just, you know, thank the Google, uh, all the team that, you know, organized all this um, so that our voice could be heard. Um, um, I want to challenge you to go out and take this voice to further places and um, let it be heard. And um, I truly believe that that would change the perspective of so many people and that would bring a change on our planet Earth. Thank you. And uh, I think for me, um, my mom is probably going to watch this, so I want to thank her for her resilience. Um, and she's the epitome of what hard work is, you know, raising six, seven kids, you know, uh, in a refugee camp and never stopping, never settling. Uh, I never saw her quit or cry. Uh, I mean, I saw her cry, but not of defeat. And so that spirit lives in me, and um, I'm thankful for the opportunity and the space here. But like Holmes said, um, you know, I like to challenge each of us to be accountable to ourselves, to our future selves, um, and be proximate to issues that are human in nature. Um, don't just stare, you know, to the other side. Uh, how can you lend voices to people who are less fortunate or empower voices that are already on their way? Yeah. To, you know, to enlighten you know, the world. And so thank you all for coming. I think you guys all took time away from work, but it's been a pleasure.